We have already heard a lot about foreign military bases on our continent. And I feel sad that Ghana is hosting one of these foreign military bases. Now, if you read the terms under which these military bases are established on our continent, you feel sad. You feel hopeless. In Ghana, we have allowed the United States of America to establish its military base on our soil. Under the agreement which allows the U.S. to establish this military base, our head of state is stopped from entering that territory. The U.S. military base is not accessible even to the head of state. As if that was not enough, in the agreement, we have committed to an arrangement under which if U.S. soldiers come to, the, to Ghana and kill Ghanaians, Ghanaians cannot go to court to ask for redress. We have committed ourselves to an arrangement under which property destroyed by U.S. soldiers in Ghana, if your property is destroyed by U.S. soldiers in Ghana, you cannot go to court. We have given our frequencies for the use of the U.S. military for free. Our frequencies are given to the U.S. forces for free. When Ghanaians have to pay millions in order to get frequencies to establish radio stations and television stations and so on, the U.S. can take it for free. Excuse me. Under the agreement, U.S. soldiers entering Ghana are not subject to inspection. They are not subject to search. You can't search them. You can't look through their bags. You can't examine what is on their body. And when they leave, they are also not subject to customs inspection. They cannot be searched. U.S. soldiers do not need passports to enter Ghana. They don't need passports to enter Ghana. All they need is their ID cards. Under these circumstances, we have given U.S. soldiers privileges way and above diplomats. Because even the American ambassador needs a passport to enter Ghana. A U.S. soldier does not need a passport to enter Ghana. In any case, what are these soldiers doing on our continent? What are they doing on our continent? Our leaders must ask themselves some interesting questions. Of course, they say that there's a global village, whatever that means, but they say that there's a global village. If this is a global village as they define, then everybody has interest everywhere. Now, if we decided to station a battalion of the U.S. Of, of the Ghanaian army in Washington, what would happen? Now, if the U.S. would not allow us to station a battalion in Washington, why do we then allow them to station a battalion on our soil? Ab initio, this arrangement means that we have accepted that we are inferior. And that is one of the reasons why we need to wake up and dismantle these arrangements in order to establish our equality and so on. I suspect that I'm already speaking more than 15 minutes, but I think that it would be inappropriate if I do not touch on the question of Ukraine, the current question. Ukraine, what has that got to do with our sovereignty? A lot. As we speak, many African countries are in situations of war. As we speak, 80% of the land territory of Burkina Faso has been taken up by insurgents. Only last week, eight soldiers of the Togolese armed forces were slaughtered by Islamic insurgents. Two weeks ago, the northern border of Benin was attacked. As we speak, West Africa is in turmoil. Nigeria, northeastern Nigeria, is, is, is on fire by Boko Haram insurgents and so on. There's a low-intensity civil war in the Niger Delta and so on. Somalia is becoming a failed state and so on. Nobody 
talks about these developments on the African continent. We are all told to focus on Ukraine. Why? Why Ukraine? What is my worry with Ukraine when West Africa is burning and nobody is talking about West Africa? What is my worry with Ukraine when there is war all over Africa? I think that the time has come for us as Africans to begin to think about how to build our own nations and how to free, free our own nations from the ravages of war and so on. As we are being told to join Ukraine in the preservation of democracy and so on, we see pictures of Africans in Ukraine who also want to flee the war like the Ukrainians and who are refused access to buses taking people out of the war zone. There's a story of a Nigerian student who had to work for 12 hours because Ukrainian security people decided that the buses that were taking people to Poland were not for Africans. If the Ukrainians would not respect us and treat us with dignity, like all other people, like themselves and so on, what business do we have wasting our time, our energy, our resources, our brain power on defending Ukraine? We Africans are not inferior to any race. And we must insist on the fact that we have the same faculties of, like all people all over the world. And we are not ready to compromise on our dignity. In any case, if you look at the war in Ukraine, my comrades and friends, the war in Ukraine, look at those fighting the war. Who supported us in our struggle against apartheid? It was certainly not the United States of America. It was certainly not NATO. The support we had to fight for our dignity, to stand up for who we are and so on, came from the Russians. It came from China. It came from Cuba. It came from Cuba, who sent an internationalist force into Angola. It came from Cuba, whose armed forces surrounded the armed forces of apartheid South Africa and forced them to surrender in the Battle of Quito Carnaval. It came from the Cuban internationalists who forced the apartheid regime to capitulate. We cannot forget our friends and we cannot forget our history. We have friends and we have a history that we need to protect and we have interest to protect as African people. The battle for the liberation of Africa must continue, and it is indeed continuing, and we would not stop until Africa is fully liberated from the clutches of exploitation, from neocolonialism, and from the underdevelopment which is imposed upon us by capitalism. We must win this battle, and we will surely win the battle. We win the battle under the banner of Pan-Africanism and socialism, and nothing will stop us. Comrades, thank you.